He who is quick to borrow is slow to pay. Isn't this Sri Lanka? Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation. Our topic of discussion today is domestic debt restructuring. Who will ultimately pay the price? To discuss all this and more, we've invited four guests to our studios this evening as well. Joining us this evening on the show are Murtha Jafaji, Chairman of the Adhikara Institute, Damit Pallavatha, Deputy General Manager, Hatton National Bank, Dr. M. Ganesh Murthy, Department of Economics, University of Colombo, and also Attorney at Law Manjika Fernandapule. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us this evening on Face the Nation. Thank you. To pose questions from our panelists, uh, onto my immediate right is uh, Nirish, uh, onto my immediate left is Shania, and onto my far left is uh, Jamal, uh, who's joining us this evening on the show to pose questions to our panelists. And you could also direct your questions on the number 976 656 5353, the number once again, 976. 656-5353 and we would love to take those questions to the panelists as the show goes along. So let's start off tonight's show with Murtha Jafaji, Chairman of the Advocate Institute, who will give us an overview with regard to what our topic today is and what it means to organizations like the Advocate Institute. So let's start off with Murtha Jafaji, Chairman of the Advocate Institute. So let me uh, frame the problem. Uh, there has been an old adage that Sri Lanka has always been living far beyond its means and that is the crux of the problem. So we have celebrated 75 years of independence and if you look at the government's budget except for four years, a uh, couple of years in 2017 and 18 and a couple of years in the 1950s, uh, we have been posting what is called a primary balance deficit which means it is the government revenue minus expenditure without interest. So it is this accumulation of these primary balances over the years that created the foundation for the debt. Now, when you uh, pile on debt, it will also attract interest. And this interest over time snowballs. So just as a saver is told that compound interest is your best friend, if you are a borrower, it's your worst enemy. So what has happened to Sri Lanka is that the debt has snowballed to a level where it is unsustainable relative to the size of the economy. And that has precipitated this debt crisis. To give you some examples, uh, the debt, which is the public sector debt, which includes the central government and the guaranteed state-owned enterprises and the central bank, has been estimated by the IMF to be 128% of GDP. For a middle-income market country like Sri Lanka, market access country like Sri Lanka, uh, the safe level should be around 70%. So we are way past any kind of red line. And the interest cost is currently about 6.5% of GDP, which is one of the highest in the world. There's another metric called gross financing needs, which is the amount of debt that comes due every year. For last year, that amount of debt was about 30% of GDP. So as per our IMF agreement, uh, we have to bring that 30% of GDP down to 13% of GDP in four years. Which means that the primary balance deficit, which was 4% last year, has to be flipped to 2.3% in four years' time. And the amount of debt that is coming due every year, which is estimated at 26% of GDP, has to be brought down to 15% of GDP. So these are the parameters under which uh, this whole issue of debt and its restructuring is to be done. About 50% of this debt is externally owed uh, because the currency depreciated by something like 60% from 200 to 320. And the balance is owed domestically. The domestic debt is mainly in the form of treasury bills accounting for about 4.7 trillion and bonds which are more longer term securities uh, which total about 9 trillion and there is some debt owed to the central bank which is called provisional advances of about 400 to 500 billion. So this sums up the problem that there is an enormous amount of debt that your economy is carrying and the best analogy I can give to your viewers is it's like some of us carrying a very large load on our head. Our ability to operate normally is significantly impacted the larger the load that we carry on our shoulders. And therefore, this load has to be reduced. And that is the premise of this debt restructuring. So the question is that who is going to participate 
in this adjustment is a question. There are two constituencies, as I spoke about the primary balance. One is that the tax revenues have to be significantly increased so that the primary balance can be more to a surplus. The other is the debt holders to whom there are principal payments and periodic coupon payments and interest to be paid. They have to participate in some kind of restructuring where this can be more manageable about by stretching out the time period, reducing some of the interest rates and in a very selective cases, the principal amount owed may also have to be adjusted. So that, Shamin, sums up the, the problem. When you say the principal amounts need to be adjusted, what does that mean? Uh, so for example, if you have an instrument that has a face value of 100 rupees, which means at maturity you are going to get 100 and the interim period that you are going to get an interest payment, which for a debt security is called a coupon, in very selective cases, the principal may have to be adjusted. It will be more so for the commercial debt rather than the domestic debt. The, the external commercial debt may have to have some kind of principal adjustment, but unlikely for local debt. So I was listening to one of your speeches uh, lately, Murtaza, and you say that uh, when it comes to domestic debt, it has to be proportionately divided amongst all. And that should be the premise in which the government should start acting. So that means when it comes to treasury bills, there needs to be a haircut. Uh, when it comes to treasury bonds, there needs to be a haircut. What percentage do you suggest? Yeah. So we have to be careful with the, uh, uh, the terminology that is used. When you normally use the terminology of haircut, that means you are adjusting the principle. And it is n not necessarily at this stage that you will need to adjust mm. the principle. So the definition of haircut may not be relevant, but what will be needed is that the maturities of these instruments, so the, what, what is called the average term to maturity, that if you take the totality of the bonds outstanding, the average maturity of that is about four years. And since we have to stagger this over a longer period of time to get the gross financing needs down, which means the amount of debt that comes due every year that needs to be rolled over, so if there's a lot of money that is coming due every year and needs to be rolled over, the risk is increasing because of that. So you've got to push this out as much as possible. You will have to probably start adjusting the maturities, which is called reprofiling. And some of the coupons, which would range between 6% and 20%, will have to be adjusted to a more manageable amount, considering that inflation and interest rates are expected to come down significantly by the end of this year that there is no justification to pay this kind of very, very high coupons for the next 10 years of, or shorter perhaps. So, so uh, another one more question, then I want to move to um, Damit Pallavata, Deputy General Manager of Hatton National Bank. So when you say that the government needs to take action to ensure that uh, the cash flow remains as it is, let's say I invest 1 million rupees on a treasury bill with an expectation of a 32% interest for a period of three months, what's the impact it's going to create on me? Okay, so you've got to understand, and we can dig into this a little bit, that of the total domestic debt, which is in the form of securities, nine trillion is in the form of bonds, which are much more longer term securities. And the treasury bills are about 4.7 trillion. I'm subject to correction because every week it kind of it changes. changes yeah. Out of the 4.6, uh, 4.7 trillion, about 2.6 trillion is owned by the central bank. The rest is owned by the public. And there is a list of people towards the end of 2022 based on institutional who owns it. And then you have a whole bunch of bonds, of which 43% is owned by the EPF. The banking sector has about 30%. Then there are insurance companies. And then there are many different, different entities out there. So it's fairly distributed. So in answering to your question, <laughs> It is highly unlikely that, and the central bank has come out and said this, uh, both the Treasury and Central Bank gave a joint, uh, uh, I think, uh, presentation on this, that they will not restructure Treasury bills. And the reason you do, do not restructure Treasury bills, unless it is totally unsustainable, because it's an instrument that the central bank uses for liquidity management and something called open market operations. So since the bulk of it is owned by the central bank, which is also owned by the government, restructuring will not have an excessive impact because the large amount of interest that the central bank earns goes back as dividends to the government. 
So the fact that you extend the maturity and reduce the coupon, you're taking it from one pocket and putting it into another pocket, so it won't have a significant impact and it can be done. And that is why they have come out and said that they will restructure it. Right. Uh, thank you very much, um, Murtaz Jaffa, the chairman of the Advocate Institute. Murtaz, I recollect a couple of years ago before all this struck, uh, and uh, Sri Lanka was in a dilemma. You came on Face the Nation and you said uh, in your final remarks, we are in the ICU and the economy needs to be treated. Do you think the government is treating the economy well now? So let's, let's put it to you this way. Uh, taking into account the advisors that the government has got, and we have very erudite Sri Lankans. For the first time in my life, I have seen Team A betting for Sri Lanka. So I have a lot of confidence mm. that we are getting the best possible advice that we can have access to. I mean, that doesn't is mean that government is not an, uh, not an advisor to the president. Not at all. Okay. Uh, uh, as you say, advocata is about advocating. Our mission is to communicate to people between the ages of 16 and 35. Coming back to the advice, we probably have some of the best doctors, if I use that analogy, advising, but it's still going to be painful. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Murtaza, for your thoughts um, in the first round. I now move my attention to Damik Palavat, the Deputy General Manager, Hatton National Bank. Thank you. Murtaza said the stage actually what the uh, uh, debt restructuring is going to be, what are the numbers uh, that are in the market subject to uh, uh, possible debt restructuring. If you look at the banking sector, right? So whatever that we do with the restructuring, I think that has to be carefully looked at because we have invested public money in those instruments, treasury bills and treasury bonds. If you, if you go back a few years, starting probably 2019, since then, banking sector supporting the central bank and the government, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, need to help the businesses, the Sri Lankan economy by providing moratoriums, providing restructuring, which are most of the time on unfavorable terms for the bank. Mm. So it already got uh, some element of impairments which have never seen hitherto in their balance sheets. So that has depleted their capacity to absorb furthermore. So, so even though the debt restructuring is the topic of the, uh, you know, we want to take it up, mm. so there is a bigger elephant in the room that is the uh, Stage 3 uh, loans and the impairments that are going to hit the balance sheets of the bank. So we have just seen, you know, some of those are coming in as of December. We have seen uh, impairments have increased as never before the highest level. So when and you say, uh, seeing, just want to get some clarity, Damit, when you say impairments, those are bad loans. Those are bad loans. Right, okay. So right? for the benefit of our viewers to make it Because simple, businesses so. are coming out of the moratoriums, they are not set, the economy is on the revival mode, they are not generating enough revenue. So obvious the banks are, you know, recording those impairments over a period which has stressed their balance sheets. As of now, the banks are operating within the regulatory limits for capital adequacy and the liquidity coverage ratio and, uh, you know, uh, uh, liquid uh, uh, asset ratios. Mm. If you look at the investments that the banks have made on the treasury bills, bonds and the government securities, so by regulation, banks are mandated to invest certain percentage in government uh, the securities to maintain the uh, LAR, which is a liquid asset ratio and also the liquidity coverage ratio. So we are mandated. So we Every investment, the contra entry is a customer deposit. So we being the custodian, we go and invest those money in uh, uh, treasury bills and uh, treasury bonds. So having taken the impairment pressure on the balance sheet and also for prudence sake, so having seen that the ISBs have potential, as Murtasa said, the, the adjustment on the principal. So we have also made certain level of provision uh, in the balance sheets as of last uh, end of December and also uh, first quarter this year. So are you trying to say, Damit, that the banking sector in Sri Lanka is suffering at this very point of time? I would say yes, because the banking sector is supporting the economy for last four years. So for the businesses to come out of what they have faced because we, we get the depositors money even though the loans are not paid we can't go and tell the depositor we can't pay your interest on the deposit. So we have been managing that and it is stressed to a level that anything that we do with the holdings of banks has to be done carefully mm. and 
see what are the resulting so, uh, impact going to be. So, so, yeah. so Damit, uh, April generally is the uh, month that bonuses are paid to employees. How much of bonuses did you pay for your employees this time when you, when you came to the month of April? So that, that depends on the performance, right? Yeah, so, so let's so say we, we averaged how many months did you pay? So that, that, that depends on your uh, performance structure, right? So no, because most will of be the time, the, 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 the question is, uh, the banking sector says that they are stressed um, and they seem to be paying bonuses of employees very handsomely. Now, I'm not just talking about HNB for that matter, but many other banks as well. They've declared uh, dividends um, in certain cases as well if you look at the balance sheets. So you see the banking sector uh, being stressed, but not stressed to a point where it is the red light, is it? Uh, I would have a different view, uh, Shamir. Now, if you say banking sector is not stressed to the red light, so if you look at from a depositor's point of view, they would like to see the banks are kind of operating comfortably because they, they need the confidence that deposits are safe, which is indeed the case. But if you look at the dynamics of how the balance sheets are built up, what impact the capital has, capital of the banks have, and the reserves that have depleted, which needs to be uh, replenished. So the effort and the uh, you know impact in terms of infusions will be very much higher. I, I pose a question to you why? Because Murtha said that uh, hard decisions, painful decisions have to be taken even now. When Ranil Vikram Singh went into parliament recently and said if the banking sector wants to manage the country's economy, let them do it. Uh, let them come to the forefront and manage the country's economy. What did you think about that statement now? So, uh, let's look at it this way. Are you all trying to manage the country's economy? Are you putting too much of stress on the president? Let me put it this way. No, anyway, no, the, no. anyway, the banks are managing the country's economy by furling much no, needed are you support to pressure? the year. Are you all putting pressure on the president? Not necessarily the president, but we are supporting the industries and the businesses who have got stuck, you know, going, about trying to going under the water. Don't worry, Damit, I'll give you a lot of time when the second round starts uh, to talk about that. Uh, Damit Pallavat, um, Deputy General Manager of the Hatton National Bank. Uh, so, uh, I just want to make it clear to our viewers that Damit is uh, the only individual who is representing a corporate entity uh, in Sri Lanka at this, on this stage. So, um, we respectfully agree to all the thoughts that you express as an individual as well, uh, Damit. And if you want to absolve yourself from, uh, uh, from the post of Deputy General Manager of Hat National Bank and being a bank on the show tonight, uh, we respectfully agree to that as well. So Thank there's you, no harm in past rules. So we are respect uh, of you coming on the show tonight. Uh, that's that, that's that's the bigger uh, bigger th th thought as far as we are concerned. So thank you very much, Damit, for joining us this evening on Face the Nation. I now move attention to Dr. M. Ganesh Murthy, uh, representing the Department of Economics, University of Colombo. What are your thoughts on domestic debt risk? You, you, you usually be you're very. Uh, uh, pessimistic, uh, Dr. Ganesh Murthy. Let's let's talk a bit, with a bit of optimism today. Right. I, I wanted to be <laughs> optimistic, but unfortunately, that things are making you know to feel that more optimistic, uh, pessimistic. Like uh, anyway, I'll try my best to you know to strike a balance between the two, uh, to be neutral. Um, what uh, I thought of uh, uh, starting off with uh, for a layman, what is this domestic? Uh, debt restructuring like why it is happening what is the meaning of uh, uh, this uh, restructuring yeah. so if a person takes a loan and uh, continually is doing the loan in order to repay the loan and there is there, there's a uh, situation where he could not borrow more so there where it comes what to do with the existing loan so he is not in a position to repay the loans and he could not take more loans as well so he's in a bankrupt position so there comes the an institution like IMF and say that okay we'll help you but you have to do these 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 things so you have to reduce your loan and there where the debt restructuring comes mm. so this time the uh, IMF told that uh, both uh, uh, international external debt and as well as domestic debt need to be, or both need to be restructured because that's, that's the, point blank you said in the yes, IMF yes, recommendation yeah mm. you have to reduce it because but they they all say that 
the same treatment that is meted out for international uh, debt holders should be meted out to the domestic debt holders yeah, as well. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. So it has to be uh, equality should remain yeah. prevail. To uh, re-establish uh, debt sustainability and uh, it should be acceptable to uh, the society both uh, socially and politically as well. So they mentioned that also in the report. Any research stuckling should be acceptable politically as well as socially. So that, that part is there. Even though the medicine is bitter, it should be given in a sugar-coated pill. Mm. That's how they put it. And why this is happening? Because the government has to maintain its sustainable debt level and also financing needs. And third, a comfortable debt ratio, uh, uh, GDP ratio. And this is the main objective why the restructuring is done. And how to do this? It is not just, you know, the, the government go and tell or dictate the, the debt owners or uh, holder of this debt. We're going to, do, we're going to restructure it. Like. So it's a, it's a uh, kind of a negotiation process through which this should be achieved. In there, three uh, ways or methods of restructuring are there. One is face value reduction. This is also known as a haircut. So the face value of the loan could be reduced with the discussion or negotiation up to a certain level acceptable to both the uh, creditor and the debtor. Second method is the maturity ex extension. This is what we call the moratorium. Mm. So there the nominal face value and the, uh, the structure of the loan remain the same but the repayment time could be extended. And third one is the coupon um, adjustment. So coupon adjustment is also uh, to adjust the net present value of the future income so as to give some uh, relief for the uh, debtor uh, uh, who has taken the loan. So these are the three main uh, methods. Of but I thought, uh, Dr. Ganesh, just to interrupt you there, uh, I thought the haircut method, reprofiling, you didn't talk about it. Yeah, reprofiling is that what we call that uh, the um, reprofiling uh, are the, is the name. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. that's a maturity extension. Yeah. Okay. A maturity right. extension. Right. So therefore, these these three methods are not used individually. Mm. They are not mutually exclusive as well. So they can be adapted in a mix. Mm. In a mix also, it can be adapted and right. and um, um, in case of domestic debt. The first method uh, may not be adapted, it seems, according to the communication so far. You say, you, you say Dr. Garan Shamurthy, that people should be given the bitter pill uh, after making sure that it's sugar-coated. Yeah. Would the people of Sri Lanka swallow that pill when you speak about domestic debt restructuring? Would they want their money to be uh, reprofiled or would they want the, a haircut or would they agree for a maturity extensions? Um, or even coupon adjustments, would they agree to this? Don't you think seven months or eight months down the line, people may be on the streets again because of this? Well, that there is a possibility of uh, happening that, but uh, see, the we have uh, prior examples of other countries, hmm. those who have went down even uh, serious cases like this. Um, but... Uh, like example, give me a country that has gone like, down on uh, such a path and uh, missed it uh, up 2000, uh, Asian crisis during that period you can see that a lot of countries have gone the mm. down right so we will get back to dr ganesh murthy with uh, your thoughts uh, on this subject momentarily as we go along i want to now focus my attention on uh, attorney at law manjuka fernando what are, what are your thoughts on, on today's first topic? of all i would like to thank you for being on this show it's a privilege to be in from we were to be a in the, be in the panel and I, that's a great privilege and thank you first of all let me just try to set the framework of what the conversation I think just to get the conceptual clarity of what we are trying to talk about see debt restructuring is just not about reducing debt burdens it's about re it is about reducing debt burden to achieve debt sustainability now debt sustainability is not merely from so state of solvent insolvency from solvency to insolvency it is more about extraordinary debt reduction both in terms of stock as well as flow to create growth inducement in, uh, investments and perhaps even more from a, from a, from a certain uh, situation of uncertainty and 
instability to certainty and uh, and stability. Mm. So, uh, Manjika, in your opinion, um, we all know that. Uh, the IMF had very clearly articulated that whatever um, uh, whatever decisions that are being meted out should be socially and politically accepted. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do well, you nah. think the people are ready to accept uh, the IMF program uh, when it comes to domestic debt restructuring? IMF has no program on domestic. IMF, IMF. Like, I think the conceptual understanding that the IMF. IMF only leads parameters, it has a DSC and its sustainability, and it has distinguished parameters. Now the question is when, whether we have, the re, the IMF has said that uh, we need to achieve debt to GDP at a particular point, mm. that is I think to the of the 95 percent. We need to create uh, what in the another, another, another metric of debt burdens is the gross financial needs, and that they have given. It is in that framework that they, they have looked at, and that what you call the debt sustainability analysis. For Sri Lanka it is what you call the in, uh, but market accident sustainable analysis, it, it does. So the IMF leads, lead, gives a framework for debt. The, between the sort of the dance between the debt, various factors, sections of debt, Sri Lanka has multilateral debtors, uh, uh, bilateral debtors, commercial debtors, commercial bond debtors, and commercial like the China CDB, which is not is a loans. And you get the domestic, and even the domestic, the domestic you get the bills, the, the, and also you get loans. Now, for example, I think HMD, a lot of the banks have given guaranteed loans, government guaranteed loans, the RDA, and all those also part form of the debt, debt, uh, debt mix of the government country. Now, it is that entire mix that how do you achieve, use, how do you reduce each section or whatever to achieve the parameters of what the IMF requires. The IMF does not say that. You know, you need to do X to Y. If you read the IMF report, it, it what it talks about that is domestic, it's illustrative thing. It does not prescribe. I think the understanding that IMF prescribes the way the debt is going to restructure, it is not. The IMF is there to sort of ex give a framework for the government to restructure. The DSA is that. Uh, Manchka, tell me how will political considerations um, impact? these IMF stipulations in the future? Well, I don't think, I mean, politics, what do you mean politically in sense? Are you talking at the board level of the IMF or are you talking about... No, I'm talking politics in Sri Lanka. Stipulation of the IMF. IMF will stipulate, IMF will have to, it keeps its program, it's us to decide whether you want to engage or not engage. So whether IMF stipulations are there... Let's, say, will, let's IMF, say hypothetically there is an election. Yes. Uh, in the future, I don't know whether President Ranil Wickremesinghe will resort to an election or not. That is a big question mark. I mean, but yeah, just let's I, say I, there is an election and there is a change of government. Yeah. Um, how would how would this impact the IMF? Well, it de depends. I mean, IMF is there. Let the bonds. Let me see. Without IMF program, nobody will come to the table to negotiate, right? I mean, explicitly clear. Even if you take an Ecuador. They did a uh, commercial debt restructuring uh, and bonded, but one of the conditions is that the IMF program is there. Because the IMF program anchors it. If you look at even so, nobody will come to the table without it. If you look at, even if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the mm, an extra four, it talks about a, a specific time that they expect us to market access. Mm, right. That anchor is uh, useful for us, for the, even for the, uh, whoever negotiates, to understand sort of, as you said, the, the broad path, the choreography you need to further debt restructure. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Adla Manjuk for Anipole. I opened the floor for questions from my journalist, but uh, just a reminder you can send in your questions on the number 976 656 5353, and we would be delighted to take those questions to the panelists tonight. So, on to my mid right is Nirish, on to my mid left is Shania, far left is um, uh, Jamal. Nirish, with your permission, shall we start off with the lady here? Well, lady. Yes, yes Shania. Thank you, Shamir. Mr. Jaffaji, I had a question uh, about our debt restructuring presentation that is due. It was due end of April, now we've delayed it to mid-May. What has been the progress made on the review process and what are the implications if it's delayed again? Because I believe we're up for it in two weeks' time. Yeah, so this two-week uh, deadline is not a real deadline. It simply means that the, there will be a visiting delegation from the IMF. Uh, what I am told is that some announcement will be made in the month of May, that is this month. Uh, why it has been delayed, 
I'm not 100% sure. But I don't envy uh, those people who are in charge because it's a situation of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because the general feeling of many people is yes, we need debt restructuring, but please keep me out. So everybody says reform, restructure, but not my patch. So I think they have competing interests <laughs> from various quarters uh, lobbying uh, how to do this. And I think there is some apprehension on some of the policy makers also of what the politics and pushback is going to come. So they are taking it very, very slow and being extremely careful. And I think when they have some kind of assurances and confidence that this will be generally accepted, they probably will come out with some plan, which invariably will also get pushed back, but they will have to stick to their guns. And would there be any implication from the other side, from the board of the IMF, for delaying? I don't think this, this delay is a significant delay. I mean, it's understandable. We had so many holidays. We had Aurudu. We had the Vesak weekend. We have a central bank bill that is going to be taken up on the 11th. The IMF agreement was presented to the parliament last week. So there's a lot going on. So it's perfectly understandable if there has been a delay. Uh, so, Murtaz, there's a question for you from one of our viewers. Uh, so, the domestic debt sustainability is based on a multitude of factors of which the real interest rate is a major factor. If real interest rates are less than growth rates, GDP, then our debt sustainability ratios could be as high as 95% to 125%. So, Mr. Jafferji, is wrong in suggesting that the debt sustainability ratio should be around 75% to be at a sustainable level. Yeah. I think, you know, we must, we must explain what we are dealing with the problem in the domestic debt is not the stop, it's a flow. We are looking at the flow. Why are we looking at the flow is conceptually, I just want to, just to, to get the clarity of it, is that we are trying to deal with the problem of debt overhang. That's why when I said, what, you see, when we are paying interest to, just to cover our debt, we are not investing. It's a fiscal space that we create to invest. Mm -hmm. And that is why what is important. You know, I think, you know, when you, when I think creating a, a, a sort of a bogeyman out of this domestic debt is not helpful. The idea is that you create, you, the, no, the, it, the, it, it is not a bogeyman uh, in your eyes, uh, uh, Manjuka, because you've not invested. No, it's everybody's but invested you, in it. In but terms of, it's a question of, yeah, it's a but domestic maybe debt I can come yeah. to answer liquidity. that question. Yeah, yeah. So, the, 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 the person asking the question, uh, there is this relationship between real growth and real interest rates. Uh, so one metric mm. of uh, debt sustainability is to look at the debt in proportion to GDP. So if you can make uh, GDP grow faster than your debt, then that ratio comes down. So that person's question is that the real interest rates are deeply negative mm. because inflation has been growing at something like 50%, although uh, for the month of April it's down to 36%. And uh, the growth also has been negative, but the real interest rates in 2021 was far more negative than GDP growth. But that was for one year that is not going to sustain going forward. So what you are going to see is that inflation is going to come down significantly because of the high base effect from last year. But uh, GDP is not poised to grow very fast. In fact, this year also they are talking about minus 3% compression. So what that person is saying will be accurate for 2022, but not so going forward. So, uh, uh, Damit, you have a question from one of us. So, I'm getting a lot of questions. I'm trying to uh, put them across to all of you uh, as much as possible. But this is relating to your field as a banker, Damit. Uh, after the president's recent speech in parliament on the restructuring of local uh, debt, uh, many bank customers who have deposits are panicked on the security of their money. Some have already started to withdraw their money. What is your opinion on this issue? Has that happened? Uh, did you see an influx have of individuals have coming and withdrawing seen, their money uh, from banks? No, we have not seen uh, uh, deposits are being taken out purely because of uh, debt restructuring can threaten the 
uh, deposits that they have parked in. I, I don't think it has happened. I have not seen it is happening. All right. right? Uh, so I just want to ask you a question, uh, Damit, with relating to Lebanon, you know. Uh, I, I spoke to uh, a couple of months ago, you know, I was in the Middle East and I was able to speak to, us, uh, to speak to several individuals who are from Lebanon, who have settled in Kuwait. And they've said that overnight, their money that they've deposited at banks vanished. Uh, the banks told them, uh, your money is there, but we are not able to pay you. So as a result of that, uh, your savings um, will be null and void at this point of time. Would something like that happen in Sri Lanka? Do you envisage something of that sort happening in Sri Lanka anytime soon? As it is now, it is not. But I'll, I'll explain why I'm telling that. Mm. Now, if you, if you... But there is a threat. Is that what you're trying to say? No. As of now... The bank system in Sri Lanka is very stable. I would say it is stressed. So if you put further stress, it, it, can, it can, you know, come close to the red lines, right? But what I'm saying, mm. if you look at the capital structures no, uh, of I just, just, just want to clarify this. Now, when you say stressed... Let me explain. Yeah, you, right? yeah. Mm. So, if you look at the capital structure of banks, as of now, the banks operate within the regulatory limits, meaning there is a buffer that we have versus the minimum regulatory limit that we want to maintain. Meaning that it can absorb some of the real losses in case if that uh, impairments or provisions, whatever, that will kick in. At the same time, not only the capital liquidity also something that we need to manage because you are question related to deposits. Mm. The people will not be able to draw the money out because of the not, uh, banks not having the liquidity. So that is also something that we need to manage. Mm. So, so as of now, if you see the system... Because a lot of people, Damit, say banks are stressed and all that, but when you look at the uh, amount of bonuses they are paying the employees, it doesn't reflect that, unfortunately. So when Ranil Vikramasinghe says that the banks are trying to tell me what, how to run a country, we have to side with the president, don't you think? I don't think banks are telling how to run the country. No, that's not, this is not what I'm saying. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. This is what the president is saying. He is saying that if you all are telling him how to, that the country's economy is bad, come and run the country's economy. Are you willing to do that? So, let me put it this way, Shami, right? So, so think of a situation where banks have banks stop lending. Mm. Banks have stressed, no capital, nobody has come and put additional capital infused into the system. And no one borrows because the interest rates are high. That's right, but depositors getting benefited uh, because they're getting the higher rate. Mm. So there is always two sides to, uh, <laughs> two, 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 uh, this, right? Yes, yeah. right? So, so then what happens? How do you, So even if the debt restructuring happens, so all those who get whatever haircuts or maturity extensions or reprofile want their debt paid at some point of time. To do that, the economy needs to function. So one of the mechanisms that helps economy to function is the banking system, which facilitates the businesses to grow, sustain, and you know. So I'm having a lot of questions coming in from Murtaza and Damit for the moment. Uh, probably, I mean, if, if I yeah, can interject, yeah. because it's very important that I clarify that Lebanese analogy. Yeah. Mm. What happened in Lebanon is most of the banking system is dollarized. Mm. The people kept their money in dollars with Lebanese banks, the Lebanese banks in turn lent it to the central bank at, in terms of swaps. Central bank used all the dollars basically. So when the banks wanted their dollars back, the central bank didn't have dollars. But in the case of Sri Lanka, only about 20% of the assets of the banking system are in hard currency. 80% is in local currency. The central bank will act as the lender of last resort. As Damit says, it's the liquidity that is an issue. And as a bank of last resort, the central bank can provide the liquidity to any bank in case there are depositors who want to withdraw it and they don't have sufficient liquidity to provide the money. So that analogy of this happened in Lebanon and it could happen to Sri Lanka is not relevant. It won't come into play. I mean, it's because we, we don't have a dollarized banking system. Mm. We have rupees. Mm. The central bank as a so bank. the government can print money and give it to the people. Uh, they, they are the bank of last resort. That is why they are called a central bank. So any institution under their supervision, they can provide the liquidity. Mm. I think I just want to clarify. Yeah. If you look at the IMF report, the, the last of 6% of GDP recapitalized the bank. So what is, you see, the debt restructure is not is something by fiat. It's a negotiated process. If you take the Ghana's negotiation, they, they had a negotiation. They, they sort of had a conversation with the banks. 
and they gave a menu of options to the banks. So what is important is ensure the last thing that anybody wants is the bank run. You have to communicate to people, build confidence with people, and manage liquidity. And so, so what the president is doing is not helping. Well, the president, I'm not sure, but the president, the IMF is here. The IMF will well, last thing during a pro ongoing program a see a run on a failure of a banking system. I don't think that's we not in anybody's interest for their interest. So the banks that Sri Lanka has advisors here, the IMF program is here. Mind you, in Lebanon, there is no IMF program. The problem because geopolitics have prevented I am Lebanon from doing that. No, no, but IMF Lebanon has gone to the IMF. Well, I am no, it is it has got a staff level that yeah. the government has not bought into it and it is there. That is the problem. In fact, in a way, Lebanon is fortunate than Sri Lanka because there are many players want to give money if the Hezbollah, but only the problem is the government because I my understanding is that the Hezbollah. The perfections are preventing. Yeah, we, that we, yeah, we will talk about geopolitics in a. In a but you know, not Shamir, I so, so I, I, I think you know, uh, drawing, drawing analogies like Lebanon, like that, creating, creating that environment is not helpful. Mm. It is matter of you know, this is a matter of negotiations. Understand, nobody. I mean, I, I know I've been interacted with some of the bondholders, the law advisors. I mean, the last things that they would like to see, because they only wrote, we say blood on the blood on the streets. Yeah. So, that, that means the, the 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 reason that we are posing all these questions for information is why, because the people have uh, deposited their hard-earned money at the end of the day. Uh, for an individual um, of your caliber, hundred thousand may not be a lot of money, but for someone who's in the who's uh, in, 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 in the grassroots. Who but 100,000 will be covered by deposit insurance. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, I'm just so saying, if they, want to, yeah, if, they want to, if they want to go to, a, uh, to the treasury bills, that, that, uh, that stake, they will borrow some money, they will go to the banks, they will invest their money. So it's very important for them to make sure that the money is safe at the end I of think the day. Be, I think it's important to uh, making banking unsafe. Yeah. I think it's, it's very important, this concept that's is, right. make a, that's what I said, we should be careful in what we say about banks. You know, saying the banks are going to fall, banks are going to do this. I think nobody wants that. It's just that what we, when I said that what we are trying to achieve is fiscal space for growth, mm. because we are not. We, there's too much overburden. That's what we're trying to do. And nobody is talking about bank runs, banking. I mean, this, there are plenty of even the government. If you see, so I'm not for saying the, the bank 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 saying the banks are stressed. No, but uh, you, I no. think the words, terminology used yes. even public communicating about this should be careful. I, I mean, my, it's my humble opinion. I don't think even Ms. Palavata has, I have fully confidence that HMB would have and the government if, if they, if no, not you, the you, are, you are entitled for your own opinion. So, yeah. so Shamir, yeah, let, let me, let me also explain. Yeah. Now, now, when you say the banks are stressed, so I don't think we need to bring the, uh, you know, the conversation of whether the depositors have enough confidence in the system so to pull that money out. So there's another question relating uh, to that, Damit. Yeah. So you can uh, probably add to that as well. If banks have to take a haircut on their exposure to the government, will it affect the principle of depositors by way of a haircut who have FDs with banks or only affect bank reserves? So at the moment, our conversation on the debt negotiations is that you know, given the statutory requirement of banks going and putting money on the uh, government securities, so there has to be a different treatment for banks. And it is depositors' money that we have uh, uh, gone and put in the uh, government securities. And also, you know, I need to touch on that 6% uh, of GDP recapitalization requirement, which comes about 4.5 billion if you uh, uh, take the numbers. Uh, what is it that we are looking at? The banks, at the moment, if you look at the composition of the capital, there are multiple stakeholders. There are, there are multilaterals, there are, you know, government is part of it, corporates are part of it, individuals. So a bank going down or the system run is completely detrimental to what is happening now. So we need to, we need to make sure whatever the restructuring we done, we are doing, so we need to have a pathway, how do we service the restructured debt? Mm. You can't kill the way that how you service the restructured debt by doing a debt restructuring. Right. So, so, uh, so Mr. Palavata, I want to uh, <coughs> talk to you since in your opening remarks you mentioned about uh, the government of Sri Lanka and the relationships they have with uh, banks in the country. You said that banks at times to their own detriment have given moratoriums to, Absolutely. Uh, to uh, borrowers. So at a time like that, I've, I saw recently that the, the Sri Lanka Banks Association had released a, a, a press statement saying that 
there is a uh, lack of transparency that has been between the communication uh, from the government of Sri Lanka towards banks and they have also mentioned that uh, there could be an impact on the banking sector capital and liquidity if uh, domestic debt restructuring is to come about in the future. So can you just explain to me how vital the, the relationship and the synergy between the banking sector in the country and the government of Sri Lanka is in terms of achieving overall economic revival which is the bigger picture because we are all, all debating ultimately for the country's economy to be revived and to go towards a, a growth path. So can you explain to me how vital that relationship is and what can be done for those two entities to forge that relationship so that it benefits the country as a whole? I think and, and also what is the consultative process that has been happening or we assume has happened uh, between the government and the banks uh, uh, over the past several months because sure. uh, we assume that there has been such a process uh, which uh, it, it doesn't appear it has gone very well judging by the remarks of the president uh, about our, our banking sector. So if you could tell us how that, mm. the nitty gritty of how it works, do you all have meetings with the central bank, with the uh, finance ministry, how, how does it work? So let me come to that, I'll first take uh, uh, Jayamal's question. I think excellent question, so that is, that is something, that is a question that we need to focus on. How does the banking system help revival of the economy, right? When the uh, East attack hit and when the COVID closed the economies, mm. how did this country's economy survive, right? What is that facilitation? It has come from the banks at cost, which banks got, uh, you know, hit on the either balance sheet or the p &L. Yeah. So how does that impact the revival? So the business to happen, you know, there has to be increase in the private sector credit. If you see over the past so many months, credit to private sector has dropped, meaning it does not uh, stimulate the economy to make that the production economy or the export economy that we need to, uh, we are envisaging for. Mm. So that is what we need to, now we are all talking about the debt restructuring. Yeah. So other side of the debt, debt restructuring is how do we increase the revenue? So to repay the debt you need to have revenue. Yeah. So we, we speak of export drives, you know, how do we drive exports incremental, we mm. talk about import substitution, we talk about SOE reforms and you know, there are some conversation about broadening the tax net. So all that will adjust this other side of this debt restructuring. Mm. To, that helps economic revival. So that happens through the process of economic revival. So as you said, the banks play a key role in facilitating that. So we have, if you remember, uh, you know, over the last two, three years, we would have given life to so many businesses, otherwise we would have gone under, mm. right? So that creates jobs that flows the money into the economy, create that production economy that we are looking at. So then it's vital, so we align ourselves to the economic revival. So if the government is pushing the agenda that we need to revive the economy to support the other side of the coin, which mm -hmm. is a revenue generation, I think banks are a must They're stakeholder a facilitating mm -hmm. that. So banks are doing it and willing to do it and continue to do it. Mm -hmm. There is no question about it. Stakeholder consultations with us. Uh, so stakeholder consultation, I think the banks have uh, made a consortium. So specifically with regard to this uh, debt restructuring to have a, supported by the Bankers Association, they have continuous dialogue with the central bank and the government. So the recent statement, I think if you have read it, it's very clear there were some uh, concerns expressed if, if you do the restructuring which can impact the capital levels of the bank which result in an infusion of capital, there can be adverse impacts which can uh, scroll down to the economy which impact the revival. So some of the questions that raised, what is that word voluntary means, you know, how does that uh, uh, kind of implemented in the whole thing, maybe Murtasa can uh, shed some light on that. So, uh, Dr. Ganshamurthy, uh, you as an individual, uh, would you go to the extent of depositing your money at banks now, given the current situation in the country? To answer your, your question, I would like to uh, give an example of a recent bank run. 
mm. the Credit Suisse Bank. Which collapsed in the US. Collapsed in the uh, in Switzerland. In Switzerland, Switzerland. Yes, yes. Yes. And the, yes. And the and the and the news report read, I quote, collapse came after customers worried about safety of their funds, withdraw their money, and massa. Which means, this is run by panic situation. When there is an uncertainty that create a panic situation and also a lot of speculation, right? And we, from this discussion. The viewers might have got uh, a, a clear under, understanding about Sri Lankan banking sector is very stable, right? But at the, at, at the same time, depositors will look at whether my deposit is safer. EPF, ETF people, the wor workers might think whether I will get a lesser ETF or my ETF will be cut. These are the two questions for the common man, man's, you know, uh, perception like mm. or look side. As a common man, I would see whether my deposit, if I deposit it, whether my deposit is safer with the given interest rate. Will I get at my maturity period? Or if I, if I have a uh, kind of a fixed deposit, whether that obligation is honored by the bank? Mm. Will I get a lesser because of this? So restructuring or debt restructuring or whatever it is, it's nothing to do with the people. They, they don't worry about it. So if they feel that, okay, Sri Lankan banking sector is safer, our EPF, ETF are safer, you're fine. You can do the debt restructuring without any problem. But when there is an uncertainty created, when there is a panic situation arise, when there is a speculation rise, any bank or any institution can collapse. I gave an example with a stable banking sector uh, the example for banking sector, Swiss bank is the, uh, the, the well-known example, right? So even in Switzerland, a bank can collapse because of the bank run, the people withdraw their money in large number because they didn't believe, because there was a, there was a so panic Manjik, situation. what do you have to, have, have to say about that? Well, I, with the analogy of, I won't uh, I say that this credit is collapsed, just taken over by another UBS. So the, there was no sort of people on the, people on the street hammering on on uh, MTN to take. In fact, if you take, we were all surprised, markets are surprised that the Credit Suisse is financing Quedo's uh, uh, debt, debt to nature swap and 800 million. So it is, there is money in, I mean, we should not talk, I mean, we talk of ideas and jargon is in extreme firms. I do not think that we should, so any regulator, if you look what happened there, regular stepped in, gave another bank and they ensured that everybody obligations are met. There were, there were the, obviously even today, if you take a bank, if somebody starts to panic, a bank can collapse any day because bank is not always, cannot always meet its obligations at once. So one, I do not think the idea of thing of bank, creating an idea of bank run is wrong. What is, I think would be, would be happen is there'd be a discussion with the government and the creditors as to how you can create the fiscal space. Secondly, the government will look at, as Mutada said, is that the government will also provide liquidity support and the IMF would provide, step in to advise the government to do that. Mm. Third, third option, if you look at the IMF report, is they will also create where the extreme situations are there, they will create what you call a bank resolution process. Uh, a, a bank sort of, so that you can go and get, if there is a situation the bank is collapsed, you can have a moratorium, you can sort out the matters, give capitalization and come out of the process. That is the process of our debt restructuring. There is no sort of tomorrow you are not going to pay your pay your debt that is not what anybody is going to do why you have a debt restructure is it it's a, it's a, it's a negotiated a methodical process i mean what is needed in a debt restructure is communication and transparency so you do it and ultimately there's a report everybody knows what is it and that is what it needs to be done i think you know communications confidence building is important and everybody works in, in synchronous. So synchronous. Mr. Jafferji, I want to come back to the topic of uh, domestic debt optimization. That's what the central bank has called it. Uh, during the presentation to the creditors, uh, it was mentioned that DDO will only be done based on a voluntary basis. So against such a backdrop, let's take a look at the flip side of it. If there is a voluntary side of uh, side to this DDO, is there a mandatory element or 
who will it apply to? Will it apply to major T-bond or T-bill holders like superannuation funds, pension funds, state-owned banks? So what is the flip side of it? Because we only hear the, the voluntary element of it. What is the mandatory element? Is there a mandatory element? So I've also been wondering what this word voluntary means. And whenever I've got the opportunity, I have asked what does voluntary mean because it doesn't make sense of anybody volunteering. But let me explain to you what mandatory means. Hmm. So mandatory means that uh, most of these securities have been issued under Sri Lanka law. Hmm. So you can change the law in parliament saying that all bonds and generally bills are not restructured or hmm. it's not your first priority that you swap one set of bonds for another set of bonds. Right. right? So that's what mandatory means and you can just change the law and pass a new law and say that from this point onwards like you can do demonetization saying that this thousand rupee note is no longer valid, valid. it will be replaced with another thousand rupee right. note. You can replace one set of bonds with another set of bonds. Mm. Of course the new set of bonds will have different terms. Uh, so that is what mandatory means. Right. Now, uh, what you might have in between, and they also say in that document, no coercion. Mm. But you may have a different treatment for old bones and new bones. Mm. So they take a stick and carrot approach. Right. So for example, those who hang on to the old bones mm. uh, cannot get liquidity support from the central bank. So you can't repo so for liquidity purposes. And these instruments are held by banks because as per the Banking Act, 20% of interest-bearing liabilities have to be held by liquid securities. Okay. And sovereign issuances are considered liquid securities. Mm. So if you are going to sit on a bond uh, that does not have access to the same liquidity support, then it's not a very desirable instrument. They could also turn around and say that there is something called capital adequacy computations mm. and lending to the sovereign is zero risk rate. So they can turn around and say that the old bonds, we will not allow you to zero risk weight it and we will make you risk weight it 100%, mm. 150%. Mm. So then you have to put more capital to hold those instruments. So from a capital efficiency perspective, it is not optimal. So there are there could be different tax treatments yeah. that the old set of bonds have different rates of taxes. Mm. Uh, so there, there could be a number of sticks and carrots mm. that could be used mm. uh, to kind of nudge people to lure them towards into agreeing to, uh, going right. for the alternate thing. I see. So that's all part of the policy space mm. and uh, we don't know what they have in mind. They also can treat different institutions differently right. uh, based on the ability to sustain the debt restructuring mm. or reprofiling. My personal view is I don't agree with that. Mm. And we could discuss that if there is time of who owns these bonds and who can uh, adjust these things. Because ultimately a rupee is a rupee and we must treat all rupees equally. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if I can share something, in, in, in Jamaica, the most countries that did uh, the domestic restructure, they took bank by bank, mm. right, and balance sheet by balance sheet. And once they came to a conclusion, I think the debt of me has, that there is a, already a process that is going on. But Is that what's going on? Is that's bank something that bank? I think they're going on at the moment. But I, my, my, what my conversation with people who have done this before, it, it needs a bit more intensive. You need to look at very by microscopically each bank. And then you come up with a menu of, say, if you have a certain bond, two or three bonds on offer, so you have a menu that we will accept, will fit the particular type, we'll have buy-ins, buy and that will help help to manage the process. So you don't sort of give a all fit one all all fit one answer to this. You try to get menu of, say, you can have a, some people maybe will take a little bit more, so you create a, a bond that is for that nature. You have a, some, so you create a conversation with the, with the bondholders, with the, the central bank and the negotiations to come up with a menu. And then you probably look at it. I mean, Ghana did not have the first, so Ghana has gone through two rounds. So the first round, they kept out the, uh, what you call the pension funds out, and they got the banks in and others in. So they, 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 they got in. They are going for a second round now, and their speculation is that the, then with, uh, with the, the pensions may come in. 
but you'd look at sort of that sort of menu. You don't. Uh, this is not a very uh, you know said so that tomorrow I'm going to say the banks have reduced uh, half the, half the portfolio extension for 10 years, all everything, all the bonds. I think it's more of a much more conversation, dialogue approach they will take to this. It's but high. that that option that Manjuka is talking is a bad example of how people did it. Uh, I don't think Sri Lanka should go down that road just because other people did it. Because then you are selecting, you are picking winners and losers. And then it is very subjective. Uh, no, I mean, I, no, sorry, I mean, you misunderstood what nobody is yeah. keeping anybody out. What you do is you create everybody in. You get a buy-in from everybody, but the instrument menu is different. That's all you do. So nobody is leaving anybody out. We, you don't need to keep, because the, unlike the external side, comparability is an issue. When it's the domestic side, you don't need comparability. That's, that's how it's looked at. Because what is more important is sustaining the bank system and liquidity and not a collapse of the economy. So you would create menu of instruments to fit the bank. That's what uh, I'm saying. Do you agree with that, Murtaza? No. So basically, the, the question is that you can say that it has the same impact, but some instruments will have longer maturity, some will have an adjustment to the coupon. Mm. Uh, the question is, it's all very, very subjective. Because we can come to this whole banking issue, which I have a slightly different opinion. I think there is more fear than reality in this whole restructuring, because it's about your concern and what you've been focusing on, whether the depositors will be impacted. But long before the depositors, there are capital cushions that can absorb a lot of the loss. And you know, by the time these capital cushions get exhausted, you have tier one capital and tier two capital, uh, you are expecting then a very, very severe crisis, which I don't think it will come to. To that? Uh, I do, you can precipitate that if you make huge policy mistakes. Mm. The, these things that, you know, it's self-reinforcing. And you, and you don't envisage such policy mistakes no, so to happen? If you do it very carefully and clinically, and you spread the pain over a larger base, the pain any one entity will have to take is going to be bearable, not unbearable. So, of course, somebody yeah. is going to lose out. Lose out at the end. And of the it day. will be more likely shareholders in the case of banks or some of the someone venture to, holders. Someone has to take but the But not necessarily right. deposit. So I'm getting a lot of questions today on the show um, because of the knowledge that the four panelists are having uh, on this subject. So uh, the question is directed at Murtaza now. Uh, the main reason for the downward adjustment of, eco of our economy is due to the exchange rate overshoot that took place in May 2022. It is not what Murtaza is suggesting, wherein he indicated that debt sustainability was the underlying factor. Uh, so, he, he, the question they are asking is, no, sorry, the exchange rate created the crisis? Well, yeah, the, what he is saying is, um, it was the exchange rate overshoot that took place in May 2022 uh, which uh, created the downward adjustment of the country's economy and not the underlying factor when it comes to debt sustainability. Mm. So the exchange rate was a symptom, right? It was not a causal factor. So what happened is that you, in the year 2020 and 2021, you kept interest rates at artificially low level. You had record amount of credit growth. Uh, you kept the kind of through moral suasion, you kept the exchange rate at an artificially low 200 rupees. Uh, you continue to use all your reserves to pay uh, some of the ISP <coughs> holders. So you exhausted your reserves. And then you allowed the pressure to build. And you did revise the price of electricity. You did revise the price of diesel. You did revise the price of petrol. So I can show you if I had my chart book. The amount of excess demand that was going on in the economy, especially in the year 2021. And as a banker, you can ask Amit about how much a demand there was for imports, etc. So there came a point when we started running out of dollars and there was scarcity, etc. So it was like the pressure was building and building and came April. And when you let it go, they, they sequenced it wrong. That they let the currency go. They, could have, they should have taken other steps before. To manage it better. They should have taken other active steps to slow the demand, like increasing interest rates, put in certain import controls, etc. And finally let uh, inter, uh, in, uh, exchange rate go, then you wouldn't have got such an overshoot. 
So what did happen is that when you allowed all this pressure to build and let go, it just exploded. And that is where you had such a massive adjustment of something like over 70%, 80%. And then when the contraction came, the currency uh, appreciated again to 320. So we don't know what the market level is going to be. What is going to be the market level in 2023? So we don't know, Shamir. I honestly don't know because we don't have a liberalized market. You still have import controls. We haven't been allowed cars for the last three years, right? And a lot of the firms had excess amount of inventory going into this current crisis. So their imports have double come down. It's not only a contraction of demand. So for example, things like cement are down 50%. Discretionary items are down 25 to 30%. Construction, Staples, is, yeah. construction is the worst the worst affected, right? So first they have to run down their inventories, which is probably done now. And you see the import demand slowly, slowly coming back. So we will probably know what the most stable rate is towards the end of the year. So, uh, Damit, uh, with regard to these depositors, uh, we have a question for you. Uh, what is the position of the depositors who have invested in wealth co-subsidiaries of banks? Um, they've mentioned a few banks, but because the representatives are not there on the show tonight, I'm not going to mention that. But they've also mentioned HNB Finance um, in comparison to banks. So let me let me put it this way. Now, to hit the impact to depositors, there are multiple layers. I think Murtaza has Murtaz, yes. very nicely, articulated that. Yes. So yeah. so the capital buffers that they have is the shareholder who's going to be affected first. First, it's mm -hmm. going to be the capital buffer that buffer, gets yeah. absorbed, and then it will trickle down. But I I don't see at the moment there is a risk on any depositor getting hit simply because they have invested in a. Uh, the institution has invested in a government security which is subject to uh, debt restructuring. So there was a time, uh, uh, there was a time, uh, Damit, that when you go to uh, some of the, uh, some of these wealth core subsidiaries, they came up and told some depositors who were investing on fixed deposits that they were not reinvesting in treasury bills or treasury bonds and that is why their interest rates were much lower than interest rates of other uh, institutions. Is that an argument that can be bought by a, a, a depositor? So, uh, so that is pure speculation, right? Mm. So like now, because of the announcement of district debt restructuring has not uh, done, there are so many opinions and views expressed. Similarly, from time to time, with regard to bills and bonds, those speculations have come across. So some institution has decided I'm not going to invest in treasury bills or bonds. So then if they don't have that option to invest in uh, bills and bonds carrying that amount of yield, what are they going to do with the money? So they can't give that uh, return to the deposit. No, but if you, look at, if you look at the banking sector, Damit, now um, I've <laughs> invested my money at uh, several international banks operating in Sri Lanka. Uh, the interest rates that are being yielded on those deposits are much lower. Uh, than the interest rates that are offered by local banks. If you look at look at the international banks that are operating, their fixed deposit rates are going at approximately around 4% to 9%, whereas the local banks in Sri Lanka offers an interest rate of 24% and 26%. Why is that? There is a reason. So the local banks, so when you raise the deposits, if you can't deploy that in the loans, which is the case, you know, past maybe here also because there is a very low demand for credit. So where do we deploy the funds? So we deploy in uh, treasury bills and bonds, mm. right? So mainly treasury bills because it's short term, we can manage. So uh, if the government so takes that haircut or reprofiling or uh, maturity extensions that were spoken about on this show a couple of minutes ago, how would that impact the depositor? So I, I, I think the before coming to the deposit, I am reiterating, Shamir, because if you bring the depositor into the conversation of debt restructuring, I think it's a little far-sighted and it, it is, uh, you know, probably out of the circle happens, that uh, we would, uh, you know, need to take this conversation. So people don't have to worry yet? The can, depositors can don't have at, to worry uh, about it. Yeah, right? Can yeah. we also look at uh, the superannuation uh, funds, uh, EPF, ETF uh, and uh, private pension funds? Uh, what could be the impact on them? We've been talking about the banks uh, quite a bit. What about the uh, EPF? So I, I, w I would 
prefer to refrain within the banking uh, probably. Can, yeah. can I address that to Dr. Gavinesh? Well, um, EPF, ETF also may be having certain uh, safeguards up to a certain level in order to cushion this in, uh, if there is a negative impact. But uh, as you all, I also having a serious doubt about what is going to happen in, on the EPF, but uh, uh, the, the uh, the, His Excellency the President in the parliamentary address, he mentioned briefly that uh, we have created the EPF and they, there won't be any impact on the EPF like. So, we'll believe in that. But in the past there have been dubious uh, uh, instances where the EPF's uh, uh, investments in the stock market uh, were called into question. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, that's not Exactly true, true, comforting. True enough, true enough, but uh, none of the EPF holders, uh, those who have got, you know, retired, did not uh, face any difficulties in getting their funds. Mm. Dr. Ganeshwarthi, now, uh, I was of the opinion the government has stopped paying their loans. Yeah. I was of that opinion. I thought the government has stopped paying their loans. But a few uh, days ago, there was news uh, saying that the government had, a pay, had paid a loan to the Indian government. Uh, yes, uh, with the How IMF, did that happen? IMF uh, funding, uh, they have to repay uh, a part of the loans because uh, that is not an actual loan. It's a repayment uh, uh, through the Asian clearance. So it's a, it's a, it's due. It was pending for for quite a. Did long India time. ask for that money? No, no. That is the support given by the Indian government to clear the, uh, the some of the some funds through the Asian uh, Clearance Union. They have postponed at that clearance. But I was, all, I was all, always of the opinion that multilateral donors like IMF, World Bank, uh, and uh, EDB or ADB for that matter, those loans have to be repaid even though the government declares bankruptcy. But such loans can wait, isn't it? There is, this, this is what, what, what is called trade finance. Yeah. Trade finance loans are like importing with every day. Those also kept out of the debt, debt parameter, mm. the restructuring parameters. So if you look at anything, they normally don't restructure, uh, restructure because that's in the money you need for everyday living in the country, right? So then multilateral debt payments, for example, hold why you don't restructure them is that they it values the AAA status they have, and they can borrow, uh, borrow from the market and give at cheaper rates to the at uh, cheaper rates to the country. That's the reason the ra rationality of Material debt been excluded. So two expects the ACU the, in, in Asian Clearance Union is a, is basically trade credit been been and fact that we did not pay our trade credit is, is would have been a big problem. Uh, so can I, yeah. Shamit? There, there's an important clarification here I want to make. Right. So what is this Asian Clearing Union? Hmm. So there are about seven countries. It's actually headquartered in Tehran. Uh, all the SAC countries are pretty much there, and. Most of the trade between these SAC countries, uh, when an exporter and importer trade, the central banks settle every two months amongst themselves. So we have a large trade deficit to India. So we had our central bank and large amount of money owed to the Reserve Bank of India. And when this crisis was brewing uh, in towards the end of 2021, and for the first half of 2022, under the exceptional support given by the Indian government, the Reserve Bank allowed us time to pay those owed money. Mm. So they gave that got postponed and postponed. Now that was not given to the government of Sri Lanka. It was a credit given to the central bank. So it is the central bank that is extinguishing some of its liabilities if it has settled some of those ACU payments. Mm. Right? The other thing, if you permit me, which is very, very important that I have to explain, is about accounting. You know, your, your, your viewers should understand about these losses, etc., and how banks work. So what banks do is that they mobilize deposits, which are more short term, at a particular interest rate, and they add a net interest margin to mobilize money and relend it. So in the case of uh, securities, government securities, they account it under a certain bucket called amortized cost. So if there is some kind of restructuring, uh, you may have to revalue them at what is called fair value. 
and when you value these new bonds, the problem is that because of the extreme uncertainty that is happening in the interest rate market, the interest rates at which government securities are uh, issued at are abnormally high, unjustifiably high, mm. because uh, government securities are considered risk-free. So the policy interest rates of the central bank are 16 and a half percent, and these securities are being issued at about 22 percent, 23 percent. So what explains that huge divergence between policy interest rates? It should normally be of the nature of half of a percent to one percent, but it is now about six percent. So the fear of some kind of restructuring is imposing a very high credit risk premium on what is normally considered a risk-free security, right? So the two things are endogenous, that means they're interlinked. So you're saying that come the next few weeks? No, let's say that with inflation coming down and the fact that if a domestic restructuring is announced and that credit risk premium goes away, the market interest rates will significantly come down. So even if you were to adjust the coupons on some of these very high coupon yielding securities and extend the maturities, the deposit interest rates will also come down significantly. So, so the theory so is... Then, yeah. if I may finish, yeah. they can easily manage the situation. Mm. So the problem here is when you readjust with the debt restructuring, how you are going to value, and that is in the realms of accounting. And there may be some kind of regulatory relaxation, etc., that can be done to avoid what is called a day one loss. Because it will be ridiculous to try to revalue these uh, uh, new bonds at 22% interest rate because then yeah. the value will come down significantly. So, Bursa, when do you see the policy interest rates coming down and a readjustment taking place? Uh, so, so, there are two. No? One is this huge credit risk. So that is mainly due to the fear of a domestic debt restructuring, and the soon and that's fair for the yeah it is fair it's because fair. That, that's how the, the person who is getting twenty two percent is being told that you may not get twenty two percent if there's a restructure. Fair enough. I mean that's the market signaling. Mm. As far as the policy interest rates are concerned, it's all tied to inflation. So we saw that April inflation, which was announced last Friday. Uh, the rate had come down from something like 50% to 36% for the Colombo Consumer Price Index. And since the crisis started last April 2022, you had month-on-month -month large increases till about July 2022. So when we go forward in three to four months, the high base effect coming from last year is going to reduce significantly the year-on-year -year inflation. And therefore, I would guess that towards the end of the year, you're going to have single-digit inflation which will give significant amount of room for the central bank to cut interest rates. So you're saying that single digit interest rates... Single uh, in digit inflation. inflation. Inflation rates are possible in the next uh, so few months? Between March and April, based on the Colombo Consumer Price Index, month on month, the index came down by 1.5%. So the trend clearly, with energy prices globally coming down, Brent crude is at $75 today. Mm -hmm. All the indications are that those extreme situations that existed with a bit of luck, if the weather turns against us, Shamir, because it is expected that El Nino year will set in from the second half of this year, which is not very good for Sri Lanka, the trend is very clear with so much of demand contraction. And if you ask Damit, he's head of corporate banking, the demand for credit is very low. So, so when an economy is contracting, inflation will automatically come down because there is less money chasing more goods. So the government, government may even look at uh, reducing the tax rates, pay tax rates in the future as well. No, well, you keep hoping. <laughs> I, do, I, I think that will be a very, very bad move. Although there may be some case for adjustment of some of those bans. Bans, okay. So, Murtza, um, you are also a part of a, a stock brokerage firm. And if I don't ask this question from you today, um, I'll probably be failing in my duties uh, as a journalist. When you heard President Ranil Wickham Singh is saying that he would close down the stock market, didn't jitters run down your spine? So, uh, time to time he has made certain pronouncements. I don't think he means it literally. 
He doesn't mean. He just I, says I don't think he means sake. it. <coughs> so we shouldn't take him that seriously. seriously. I mean, some element of humor is permitted. In parliament? Well, there's he, a lot of things said that, uh, you know, has a different context. So I won't be reading too much into that statement that he made. He seemed more angry than uh, Probably. hilarious. So I was wondering who he saw in the audience. Yeah, I didn't see a grin, grin on his face when he said That's that. He was, very, he was yeah. very angry. Uh, very angry, yes. So as I said that, I won't read too much into that comment. So we are getting a lot of questions today, um, uh, uh, Damit, relating to um, people's uh, deposits. Uh, and fortunate to unfortunate, I'm going to take these questions up because most of the people who are watching the show tonight want to know what's going to happen to their deposit. I know Absolutely. you were very clear alongside with Murtaza, uh, depositors need not worry. So one of the questions was, which ratings have downgraded most of the Sri Lankan banks at the moment? What sort of impact would it create in the next few months, next few years, as far as uh, the banking system in Sri Lanka is concerned? So, uh, interesting question. Why Fitch has downgraded? So, they, if you read each of the reports, you would have seen one of the reasons why they have downgraded. They can't give a rating better than the country rating for institution with it. When the country is rated default, they, they can't do an uh, institution within that country better than that rating. So, impact is when you do transaction with a bank overseas. So, our ability to negotiate that transaction and, you know, enter into transaction is much less. Because their own, uh, probably the risk departments or whoever, have restricted their limits or cut the limits down so they can't transact with the country or institution which has a rating close to default. Right. So that has been having a lot of challenges. There were things that we have done. That also you need to know actually. When uh, at the height of this default, banks still supported transaction with overseas counterparts. So we got the support of the organizations like ADB which guaranteed some of the transactions the local bank did and supported the counterparty on the other end, so the transaction can flow through. It would have been costly, but still the transaction happened. So the, those challenges will continue until the rating is reinstated. Mm. Do, Dr. Ganesh Murthy, do you agree with uh, Murtaza when he says that inflation is going to come to single digits in the next few months? Um. Because if you look at the consumer spending, consumer spending is a little bit low. Yeah, and, and we know that when uh, consumer, consumer spending is a bit low, yeah. inflation coming down to single digits is going to be a, a far reality, isn't it? Uh, no, uh, I looked at it in a different way, this, mm. because I don't believe that uh, the inflation figures uh, uh, from the local uh, uh, institutions. So always there are some uh, issues and problems. Even at the international level, uh, inflation rate, which is uh, calculated by Professor Hankey, um, it has come down. It has come down, but not drastic as uh, the local uh, inflation um, for the month of If I'm not mistaken, Professor Hanke suggested that Sri Lanka inflation rate is going to go up by around 157% at one point as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It has come down to uh, less than 50% right now. So we can see there is a um, downward trend in the inflation rate. But um, um, I have serious doubt when it happened in the, in the single digit in the, toward the end of the month, uh, end of the year. But anyway, the downward trend is visible. But, but, but uh, Dr. Karanshan Murthy, uh, to give it to the government, there seems to be somewhat of some development, isn't it? Now, petrol prices, uh, diesel prices uh, went down by 135 rupees and people are happy. So, shouldn't they be happy? Because you always seem very uh, sceptic about the country's economy. Be a little well, bit optimistic. Well, you, people, uh, people, are, people are very much you know, comfortable now because the petrol is available and the petrol price are, are going down. Now, 30 litres. Yeah. Not, not bad. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. But uh, the economy is already shrunk. The economy is uh, on the down verge. Why are you so sceptic? Are you because going to like President no, no, no. Singer's policies? No, no, I am I, not subscribed to any particular policy. If the uh, policy is direct, uh, going through a right direction, I always praise it. But when you see this, there's, a, there's a doubt or there's a skeptic, then there, there should be expressed that skepticism. Not need, you don't necessarily always but, but look at the country's economy now, Dr. Ganesh Murthy. Petrol prices have come down. As Murthy says, um, inflation is going to come down to single digits. All good no, news. Now, this is, is what the people want. No. Now, my question is, just imagine when the government starts paying the loans back, yeah. then what's going to happen? Yeah, because we have a 
demand contraction, serious demand contraction, and also um, we have a contraction in the overall economy. So inflation naturally comes down, but this doesn't mean that the economy is doing good. When we need to see uh, expansion of the economy. Then Murtha, do you want to add something to that? Yes, so what basically, you know, inflation coming down means demand is lower than supply, right? So which means that the quality of life of most of the people have significantly gone down. You know, one third of the people, the World Food Organization has estimated has a protein deficiency. So even though inflation will come down, the whole price went up that people's real incomes have significantly diminished. So it's just that things are not getting worse, but it's not improving. That's a different matter. They're not going back to where they came from. So, do you want to add something to that? No, I mean, I, my, my, from my perspective, what, what, what you must also realize that it has a concerted effort internationally to bring inflation. Inflation is a problem everywhere. So, mm. when you look at across the across the world, across the world so yeah, I think you know, if you look at most countries, even even uh, that's why the interest rates have been high so much. So, interest rates hike means you you create contract demand even internationally. You know, if you look at what is happening in the even in even the oil markets, the government they have been everybody is worried about U.S. recession. And everybody has, so it is a, it's, it's a, it's something not, not really, you can, I won't attribute wholly to the government of Sri Lanka. And if, even if you talk about inflation rates coming up with single digits, it means that there's a fair amount of inflation has already taken the price, real, real prices down. And as, as Mutsa said, we have real, real economy, real incomes have come down. And it, that, that has not been replaced. I mean, if you look at, look at this context, contextualize this entire IMF program. If you look at what we are trying to achieve, we are trying to look at the GDP numbers in 2019, in 2027. That's what, is, what the IMF program is about. Mm. And IMF program is only about creating stability and is not really looking at growth. Growth is 3%. They, they, are, they are predict a growth for the most of the program period is 3%. So, yes, it, inflation, because to create stability, inflation will come down. But I don't know that the recovery of real income in that period is it has to require questions. So, uh, Damit, in a nutshell, what you're trying to say alongside with Murtaza is the fact that people need not worry at this point of time, is it? That's right. Uh, the government has taken corrective actions to uh, get the course right in terms of the country's economy. Is that so? We see some positive side, Shamir, because you, have, you, you could see what has happened so far. Mm. So, you will see some right policies have been... You are not as sceptic as Dr. Ganesh Murthy. So, it's like this, you know, you need to believe what you are seeing, right? You know, uh, we have seen some positive movements and uh, that's why, uh, you know, uh, even, even on the, the subject that we are talking, uh, on the debt restructuring, right? So, we don't want to disrupt that whole thing, the positive momentum. We need to do it with the least possible adverse impact. So we need to continue. The, the key is economic revival. Mm. To whatever it is, even though do you restructure, you have to pay back. So yeah. where do we go into so, it? I always ask you political questions, fortunate and unfortunate. I'm going to ask you another political question. Um, how do you think Ranil Wickremesinghe is managing the country's economy as the Minister of Finance? So the first thing is that I've had some interactions with him. Mm. Uh, You've not advised him? No. no. Uh, so this is over maybe 10 years. Mm. He's an individual who believes in markets. Mm. And my fundamental premise has been that Sri Lanka got into trouble, uh, not necessarily due to misappropriation, which is what the general public feel that a person or two people robbed the country. Uh, but it was more due to misallocation and mismanagement. Mm. Misallocation being the main causal factor. And what I mean by misallocation is that resources are scarce and prices signal the scarcity value of a resource. So in a market economy, the allocation of resources are driven by the signals that prices give. So the current president is a believer in the market economy and he has very clearly said that his economic ideology is a highly competitive social market economy. Mm. I'm a believer in the social market economy because that is a German system, which requires 
the economy to operate on market principles, but there is an element of welfareism through a provision of public services like health and education and to the very needy cash-based transfers. But you've got to have a lot of competition and you must allow capitalism to thrive, not what we had, which was crony capitalism. So he is basically trying to push that direction, but he has an <coughs> unenviable task because the challenge is enormous. Uh, you know, we have lost a lot of our talent because of the brain drain. There are very few people who have the capability to implement all the reform necessary and it is going to take a lot longer than people's own timelines. Mm. And that is where there will have to be some patience. But one of his probable weaknesses is a lot of the good reform ideas that he even had in 2002, which they are implementing now, for some reason doesn't get communicated to the people. Mm. So there is always a hijacking of the narrative. And people come up with all sorts of crazy theories and conspiracy theories and confuse the people. So are you happy with the performance of Ranil Vikram Singh as the Minister of Finance? So my premise is that he should not be the finance minister. <coughs> that we should have a full-time finance minister. And I have spoken about that. Yes, that, I want to drag your attention yes. to the on the twenty fourth on, on the twenty fourth annual tax oration of the child accountants of Sri Lanka. You you go on to say um, it is a responsibility of the finance minister to work towards increasing income while simultaneously reducing expenditure. Since this would make him or her unpopular with both his party and the public, it cannot be carried out by the head of state. You're talking about the minister of finance. So you still are of the same opinion. Yeah, I, I said that and have said that many times mm. that uh, if you look at it over the last 20 odd years, either the president or prime minister has been the finance minister. And in my opinion, the finance minister basically is a full-time job. And he cannot be the party leader or the head of state because it's a very unpopular job. You're trying to tax the people or you're trying to cut down expenditure. And therefore, uh, he should not be the finance minister. But having said that, he kind of understands what needs to be done. So it's great to have an individual like that who gets it, who understands. But perhaps an individual needs to come who can focus on that job full time because it's an extremely difficult and strenuous job. And maybe somebody younger should come in. Are you trying to say that President Ayan Vikram Singh was too old to hold the post no, of uh, finance No, I mean, minister? the reality is that he is in his 70s. Mm. And, you know, he has a lot of stuff on his plate. Mm. But it would be nice to have somebody a bit younger who can focus on the job full time. Right. I so mean, I, I think he also probably is agreeable to that if he can find a suitable candidate. So he, he won't find a suitable candidate in this parliament? I don't know. I'm just assuming. So he should go for an election? That I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I want to pick uh, the brain of all, all four of you. With regard to the country's economy, we spoke about domestic debt restructuring in length. Uh, I want to take one step back and look at the country's economy as a whole. The next few months, how tough is it going to be? The question that the people are having at the moment is, are we going to deposit money at the banks or are we going to buy real estate, for an example? That's one of the questions that was posed by our viewer, one of our viewers today as well. What, where must I invest my money? If I, have, if I have to double my money in the next few years, months, what steps should I take? Now, uh, usually, Murtaza, uh, coming to you and getting some advice means money, but this is a platform that people could probably get your insight and input with regard to how they could earn a few extra bucks in the next uh, few months, next few years. That means you're a bank, you can probably give some input with regard to that aspect as well. Dr. Ganesha Murthy, being the eternal pessimist, <laughs> can shed some light with regard to whether you agree to the analogy that was made by Damit and, um, Damit and Murtaza. And then, uh, as an attorney at law, you could say whether the money is safe <laughs> wherever they're investing. So let's start off with uh, with uh, yeah. with uh, Manjuka. With yeah, I, let me put this economy. perspective of uh, this on the EPF. EPF Act specifies that the at least accounts, the money that is in the individual members' accounts, cannot be reduced. That's an act, and I doubt it. If they, if a government brings a bill to reduce that, the Supreme Court will hold with the government. I I, I would really doubt that point. 
I, why, where I see it, probably the return on the EPF money they already have will come down. So I don't think that should be an issue. I don't think no government envisages or the IMF or any stakeholder in the, in the debt restructure, even the external debtors, will want a debt bank run. So they will be a, probably, they will oddly process this once a day. What is, so that, in that context, yes. But actually what I would also see, I would say the debt restructuring is positive, growth positive, because you already see people bring, coming back to money into the money markets into, on, the, on the short end. Mm. That shows that they are confident in it. They, they feel that stability in interest rates, stability in, for, of, of uh, exchange rates, that will be growth positive. So I don't think, you know, you will not make, this is not a process of making sort of overnight money or a speculative things you, you might, there may be speculative opportunities in the, in, if you look for it, even in the downside of things. Mm. In, even in the worst economy, people made money. My making money is not a not a not a function of growth of economy. It's not it's looking at opportunity. So that is where I put it at. But I don't think you know you shouldn't look at it from a perspective that you're going to lose all your money. You're going to be homeless tomorrow. From that doomsday perspective, should not be looked. But I think the restructuring will bring stability. It will bring uh, opportunity, and it will even uh, and that's what is shown in the money money coming into the treasury bill market. So Banjo, so this is your first show <laughs> on Face the Nation. <laughs> But uh, individuals in the caliber of Murtaza uh, Damit and Dr. Ganesh Murthy has been on the show a couple of times. So I'm very honored to and, be and, yeah, and, and, no, and, and the point that I'm trying to make is um, we've been telling the government that uh, the course that they were taking uh, since 2019, if I'm not mistaken, Murtaza. Murtaza, along with uh, Dr. W.A. Vijayavardhana, were on the show once and they said that the course that the government is going was wrong. And a lot of effort was taken by uh, individuals the caliber of Murtaza, Damit and Dr. Ganesh Murthy to put the government on track. Uh, they didn't listen. Uh, they were very arrogant in their approach and look at where we are today. Do we deserve that? That's the question, Mark. Do we deserve that as individuals? Do we deserve that as the future prospects of this uh, island nation? Look at the brain drain in the country today. It's, it's attributed to the but, uh, I mean, complete mismanagement. Yeah, just to put this at perspective, I think a lot of people see it a different. I mean, we benefited from particular policies of the government. For example, the borrowing on, on the ISBs helped help people pay less taxation. Right. So these are, you know, it's it's looking at from a perspective what we are we are here is not. I, I think I, I think uh, I, I think Manjuka, uh, your memory is a little bit short lived because in 2019, when the people were paying taxes up to 24 percent. They never went and told the government to reduce it. They never went and told the That's government. True. The government took a false decision. I recollect uh, that that week after we had Murtaza on the show, and Murtaza said, "This is the worst decision the government can take." That's correct. And right. look at look at what transpired after that. So I, I respect your. Uh, view no, I mean, that's, 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 that that that's important because what, what I, what I we, mean, we, 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 you and we want to hear what you say and we respect your thoughts but I just want to remind you we Sri Lankans don't deserve this we don't deserve this we don't deserve to be in this person go to a petrol station pump 20 liters of petrol and be satisfied with it we shouldn't uh, go at home go home and start expecting that our uh, that our electricity bill is going to go up by around 100%. That we shouldn't expect. That is not what this country is all about. It's completely because of mismanagement that we are in this scenario now. But I that's would, our opinion. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. We are, we are, we are, it's not mismanaged. Yeah. It's mismanaged. That's yeah. true. So, 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 yeah, so we, yeah. we, we we'll leave that. We'll leave yes. that notion parked. I want to speak to the three gentlemen uh, with regard to the country's economy and the way forward. So let's start off with Dr. Ganesh Murthy and then we will wrap it up with uh, Murtaza's thoughts. Um, whether it is uh, because of mismanagement or misappropriation, um, we don't know. But our neighbor, neighboring countries are growing at a very fast rate, uh, even after COVID, um, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic. So we we do, doesn't deserve. We don't deserve this kind of a situation, uh, because this is a very beautiful country with all the resources, human resources, and we are basically sending our human resources for other countries to make use of uh, the other countries, you know, economy prosper. Um, so whatever is said and done, uh, re debt restructuring would be an uh, inevitable process at this moment, even domestic uh, mm. uh, de debt. But let it be very uh, clear to everyone and the government should announce this. This is how it's going to be and make the confidence and whether the people uh, uh, trust in the government or not is a different story. But this particular aspect has to be 
uh, you know, transparent in a, in, a, in a clear manner to the people, uh, to make the people comfortable and also uh, um, avoid in the panic behavior of the people. So what you're saying is basically, uh, whatever decision that's going to transpire in the next few months has to be clearly communicated to the public yeah. what their policies are. Yeah. But usually, uh, Dr. Ganesh Murthy, we had uh, Dr. Nandalal Veera Singh on the show uh, a, a couple of months back uh, uh, prior to uh, the domestic debt restructuring or IMF programs and all that were concerned. What he said was they don't want to uh, bring in uh, the news early to the public relating to um, any any issues of this uh, sort because True, but that, it, that it sends be, out a no, panic that, message that, that already. That should not be too late also. Hmm. Appropriate time the message should go to the public, make them you know comfortable and make them trust whatever the, the government is hmm. going to take. Right. Um, so uh, I now move my attention to um, Damit Palewat, the Deputy General Manager at National Bank. So, as you said, Shamir, we have burnt our fingers so many times. Mm. So, we don't want same thing happen in the debt restructuring as well. So, then one has to be careful what impacts it brings into various segments of the economy. I'm specifically talking from the point of view of the banks in supporting the revival, how and what should be done. Nevertheless, if you look at the economic revival, there are drivers that we need to push. So, what what triggers those drivers, what facilitate is something that we need to be mindful. So I spoke of exports, I spoke of uh, you know production economy, export sub, uh, import substitution, then you know how do we broaden the tax net and the SOE reforms. All that will uh, strengthen the revenue side of the uh, government which is critical if you are looking at uh, economic revival. But you also at the same time need to be mindful if we agree on a debt restructuring, at some point we need to start paying the debts. So that means there has to be dollars moving out of the country. As of now, if you see in the banking system, there is excess dollar position in terms of liquidity. Every bank has excess dollars in liquidity. So what is the source of that liquidity is either you get remittances or you get export proceeds. But that excess is there because your imports are restricted and you are not making your loan repayments. So the moment that happens, what will happen? That's what I'm coming into. So the economic revival has to be far-sighted in that context. So no sooner you liberalize some of those imports, which has to be, you know, gradually uh, you know, as per the you know understanding that we have on the World Trade uh, Organization, so dollars will start flowing out, and we might need to pay loan installments from the day that we start the repayments on that. So then, now onwards, we need to understand that. So we can't come to you know once again situation we are tight, we can't facilitate. So the economic revival, what you are talking, has multiple multiple aspects, it's multifaceted actually. Now, we, we shouldn't go back to square one. Yes, mm. so we need to understand what those challenges and we need to start tackling them now. So I'm not, you know, harping on the fact that to do all those things, the banking system has to be stable, that is given, obvious, right? Mm. So, so, so to foresee that kind of situations while reviving the economy, right, is the challenge that we face today. I think the, the direction that what we have seen so far in terms of uh, the, this economy has taken, there were some positive signs, obviously we can see and hope those continues with the right policy decisions. With consistent policy. Consistent policy decisions and we need to facilitate uh, investments obviously. We have seen the tourism is picking up, so those are all... Remittances are coming in. Remit but, but once again, a lot of work to be done. You know, a billion dollar remittances, banking system gets only 50% of it. So where is the balance 50%? What can we do to bring that back in? Export revenue, you know, it is not only a factor of Sri Lankan economy, the world economy has multiple effects on that. The markets where we export are not doing well. So those also has to be accounted for. Mm. So that's why I'm saying it is, it is not somebody saying, you know, you need to grow this, that and, you know, revive. So there has to be a very concerted effort, understanding what repercussions can be, you know, happen if you don't do it properly uh, and who should facilitate that revival. Thank you very much, uh, Damit Palewata. I now move attention to uh, Murtaz Jafaji. 
Thank you, Shami. I've come to your program after a while, and I believe that uh, the, the last couple of times I was on your program, I forewarned of an impending economic crisis which did happen. It happened far worse than my wildest imagination. So we had something like 70% inflation, currency depreciated significantly, there has been broad-based wealth destruction of our people, and the biggest damage to our economy is that uh, the best and brightest in our country are heading to the door. When we had a record amount of a million passports issued last, last year, even I, even uh, companies that I manage, so many of my young people are leaving the country uh, trying to migrate, which is a huge loss and this will take many, many years to recover. But now that a mother of all crises has happened, this is once in a lifetime opportunity to fix things. Because what happens in the think tank world, which we call the overturn window, has opened wide. So a lot of ideas that were formerly unimplementable is now possible. So a lot of things uh, that was politically or for the sake of saying politically not possible are now possible and we are seeing on a regular basis uh, that new legislation etc is being implemented one of the most important pieces of legislation that will happen in my life is going to be debated in parliament next thursday on the 11th of may which is the second reading of the central bank bill now this is a very important piece of legislation which is very relevant to the original question you asked about where to invest money which I will try to touch on this will quite literally prohibit monetary financing clause 86 although the Supreme Court has given some kind of uh, caveat that under extreme situation that they should be able to assist the government for liquidity support uh, the money printing that has been the bane of our economy uh, will not be possible under law so the law will allow them to money print for six months, uh, but the IMF agreement, unless the bilateral funding as per the program does not come through, uh, they cannot money print. So you can presume that no more money printing from this point onwards. And money printing simply means that the government, the central bank funds the government. And since the central bank is owned by the government, it's quite literally free money because uh, the center, government pays the central bank 25% interest rate and they pay it all back as dividend basically minus a little bit of the expenses so quite literally free and therefore if prices reflect the scarcity uh, value of any resource if you are creating zero cost money then the value of money goes down and that's why you have inflation so if it comes into law and it will also have a very independent governance structure uh, the era of very high inflation, continuous depreciation of the currency going forward will significantly reduce. So that is going to be a game changer for our economy because the focus now is trying to create real growth through productivity improvements and not trying to stimulate the economy through money printing and excess amount of credit growth. So I remain optimistic going forward because this time the crash was so large that it has shaken people to the bone. And that is why my involvement in a think tank called Advocata, where we are trying to communicate, especially in the local vernacular, because economic literacy is very, very weak. And therefore, we need to get the buying of majority of the people to do all these necessary reform. Because, Shamir, who will resist this? And I have said this very publicly that this country has been run for the benefit of a thousand people and it is high time that this country be run for the benefit of the 22 million citizens uh, very quickly um, uh, Murtaza, we just uh, we're just hearing the news that uh, sri lanka's cabinet of ministers have decided to raise the limit on the issuance of treasury bills up to six thousand trillion rupees um, and the proposal will be tabled uh, in six trillion, uh, six, trillion <coughs> uh, six trillion and the proposal will be tabled in parliament in the f uh, near future and uh, the the amount stood at uh, five trillion before so at a time that we're discussing about <coughs> domestic debt how 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 practical is this solution yeah so that 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 is just the upper limit it used to be five trillion and since they have already issued 4.7 trillion it is only normal to increase that from 5 trillion to 6 trillion because of high inflation. 
the economy is now at about last year was 24 and a half trillion or something mm. so that is nothing to get excited about that uh, that is a normal thing to do will, will, will the ddr have an effect on the columbus stock market as well in the future so you know again i want to say this as a last comment the fear of ddr is far greater than the actual pain so since markets are driven by expectations mm. it is expectations that are driving the weak stock market at the moment mm. and when this ddr is announced uh, and it goes through i can assure your viewers that the pain and the damage will be a lot less severe than the expectation it's like i'm not a fan of injections thinking about the injection is far worse than getting the injection <laughs> and then after the injection you kind of wonder what was the big deal about <laughs> thank you very much uh, murtaza uh thank you very much um, murtaza jafaji chairman of adkara institute for joining us this evening on face the nation uh damit palewat the deputy general manager of hard national bank thank you very much damit for joining us this evening on face the nation Thank you very much Dr M Ganesh Murthy the Department of Economics University of Colombo and thank you very much Tony Adlo My Adlaw, pleasure to be on uh, Manjika Fernando Pulle for joining us uh, this evening on Face the Nation thank you very much uh, Nirish uh, thank you very much Anaya and Jamal for joining us uh, this evening on Face the Nation tonight our topic was on domestic debt restructuring who will ultimately pay the price I leave you tonight with a quote as I always do if you think nobody cares if you are alive or not try missing a couple of car payments and then you will see how important you are in the banking sector in sri lanka take care and good night